You want to build a juicy peach? Now, Steve, while you're talking about peaches, this isn't a farming channel. This isn't a farming podcast. Well, we're not talking about that kind of peach. We're talking about building your glutes so that they look like a peach. Glute development, building a better butt. I mean, I've been in health and fitness for almost a quarter of a century, and I've probably seen no bigger trend than having this perfectly developed butt. This is a trend that is all over the place. And I got to say, I'm a big fan of it because when you have a strong glute, uh, hamstring, lower body complex, you're actually going to be very healthy. There's a lot of men out there that don't have any glute development. They've got low back pain. They've got several issues. And so today we're going to talk about in this first episode of a three-part series, how to develop your glutes and I'm really excited because we've got the queen of glutes herself joining us today. Returning uh, to the Evolve podcast is the queen of glutes, Shelby Castleton. Shelby, welcome back. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, so exciting to have you. Uh, hey, for our listeners, again, this is going to be a slightly different series than what you have seen or heard on the Evolve podcast. But I do want to put the plug out there that if you are have found us in some way, shape, or form, and you're listening to this podcast right now, do me a favor and jump on to whatever app it is that you're listening to us on. Give us a rating and review. Our, uh, your ratings and reviews help us to reach out to and connect with even more people, help us to get this message out so that people can evolve into their highest self. So... Let's set up this episode and really the next three episodes that we're going to do the glute series. So Evolve has partnered with the queen of glutes to uh, not only do these uh, episodes, but we also have a glute series coming on to the website with Shelby walking you through. It's really this cool masterclass that we're going to give people access to part of it. And then you can purchase the rest of it if you really tr want to build your uh, your overall best butt. And guys, this is for you as much as it is for girls. Uh, you know, I know that uh, girls will uh, eat this up and say, yep, I want that. But uh, guys, look in the mirror. If you got that flat uh, butt and it's not functioning well and you constantly have low back issues and people make fun of you because your pants are just falling off of you, this, this series is for you too. So Shelby, today we're going to jump into building a juicy peach. This is something that uh, you taught me that terminology recently. Sure did. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I, I'm, I, I don't even know how I should feel now that I know that terminology, but <laughs> the reality is um, I don't have a juicy peach. Uh, and you said to me, what was it? What was the phrase that you told me? The, um, we're we're trying great into peaches grapes and the peaches. The yeah. And I think mine, <laughs> my response, uh, as we're texting back and forth about this was, uh, mine isn't even a grape right now. It's like a shriveled raisin. <laughs> I've, I've trained my glutes. I've tried to get them to grow ineffectively. And the weirdest thing is I can, I can do this with other people, but for some reason there was something off. And I, I gotta say, this is why it's important uh, for everybody to have a coach. And so when I, I started coaching uh, or started getting coaching from you, all of a sudden now my glute development is significantly better. My hips are so much better. I'm much stronger. So for anybody out there that uh, does not have a coach helping them, I would highly recommend it. And obviously go check out Shelby on the, on Instagram, check out our uh, series that we're going to be putting out here. So Shelby, let's just jump in. What are, what are we talking about when we're talking about building a juicy peach? So we, well, first I just do want to say, um, I think it's great even for coaches, you know, and personal trainers, people will say, well, why do you need a coach? You know what you're doing, yeah. but we all have our specialties. We all have those things that we're really good at. And so, yeah, there's no shame in a personal trainer or a coach having a coach. I think that's great. And that shows that you're willing, like you want to put in the work and learn more about these areas that aren't your strongest points. And so for any personal trainers out there, don't feel bad if you feel like, oh, 
well, maybe people will think badly of me or think I'm not as good of a personal trainer if I have a coach, but no, we all have coaches, even the best, you know, Michael Jordan, any, any professional sports player, they all have coaches. They all have people who help them become better at what they're already great at. So, um, so just wanted to plug that real fast, but everybody's got coaches. Everybody's got mentors, right? I mean, it's just, it's such a silly thing. Um, We just recently recorded on the podcast, another episode with our good friend, Irina uh, Ivanchenko, and uh, she had posted something on her, her Instagram recently because she teaches um, yoga and she's been working with a Pilates instructor to improve certain core stability uh, uh, problems or, or the issues that she was having. And she said, yeah, I've got a lot of people reaching out to me asking me like, well, don't you know this stuff? Well, even if she did know certain things, even if all of us know certain things, we still need a coach. You you need somebody outside of you to point out what you're doing wrong because you don't Mm -hmm. have that full 360 degree um, view of your body. And, and, And I'll tell you, I mean, to our listeners, when I had reached out to Shelby and I said, I need some help, um, we went through one session and it literally was like a little tweak here, a little change there, uh, a thought process change in like how I was driving or moving that made all the difference in the world. Sometimes it was a matter of just turning my feet out about like 10 degrees or um, instead of thinking about raising up, it was about pushing into the pad in a different way. And it just transformed how I thought about all of these exercises. So these little tips and tricks that uh, activate the muscle, get things working. Like that's where coaches come in. So yeah, I can't, can't say enough about that. So uh, full glute development. Um, this is something you've really become an expert in. Uh, tell our listeners, what, what does that mean? So the glutes, we have different muscles, obviously. The ones that we really see are the glute max. We also have So we'll keep it pretty basic, but we have the glute max, the glute medius, and the glutes minimus. And minimus, we don't really see that's hiding underneath the medius. And then the meaty part of our glutes, that's our glute max. There is an upper and lower subdivision. So really, when we're talking about glute development, we're really talking about that glute max and the glute medius. That's more the shelf that you, that you, um, that you see that people talk about the shelf. Yep. And so, um, the glute max. Yeah. So that's that big meaty portion that we're really going to work on the upper and lower subdivision of that. So when you're talking about these, um, different parts of the glutes, why is it important for people to know the difference between, uh, you know, upper, lower, the glute max, glute medius? Why is that so important for people to know? It's really important when it comes to training, because we don't want to be just training one portion the whole time, or we're not going to get that full round, um, development and everyone wants that super round peachy looking, butt. and so if we are making sure we're hitting each subdivision and that glute med, then we're really going to get that nice round development and we're not going to have muscle imbalances and different things like that. Okay. And one of the things that, um, I've loved learning from you is just the different, uh, planes of motion that you're going into and how you're thinking about it. You, you think about the training in a really, um, you know, fully developed way. Can you walk our listeners through how you think about creating a glute program and, uh, why that's so important to this total glute development? Yeah. So I like to do, um, it's called vector training. Brett Contreras, he came up with this a long time ago. Um, And it really just makes sure, like I was saying, you hit every portion of that glute. So really, I like to think of it in like vertical, horizontal, and then lateral movements. So you want to make sure you have an even amount of your, um, it doesn't have to be, I mean, you don't have to go crazy over making sure everything's super even, but just making sure you have those vertical movements. So that's going to hit more of your lower glute max. That's going to be Um, like when the glute, when that muscle is lengthened, so it's going to be like your squats, imagine squatting and that glute is really lengthening that muscle. It's going to be your deadlifts, your step-ups, Bulgarian split squats, lunges, RDLs, good mornings. So you want to make sure you have a good amount of those. Um, and then you're going to have your horizontal movements. So that's going to be more of the upper glute max. That's going to be when the glute is shortened, when that muscle shortens. So imagine like a hip thrust. When you're at that top, um, the top of the thrust, 
that muscle is really shortened and you're squeezing that muscle at the top. So mm. that's going to be your thrusts, your back extensions, your reverse hypers, um, your bridges, those kind of muscles. And then we have our laterals, which is hitting more of that glute medius. So that's going to be um, the, the peak tension is going to be like hip abduction movements. So your machine abduction, um, that's also going to be kickbacks. That's going to be your um, clam shells. That's going to be your um, sideline hip um, extensions, that kind of thing. So that's really going to give you. And, and then also you're not hitting, you can train a lot more frequently when you're making sure you're hitting all of those movements, because say you're hitting vertical those are going to wipe you out. Those are yeah. exhausting. Those are deadlifts. Those are your um, lunges. You know, I can do those once or twice a week and I'm shot. I'm sore. Those are going to get you a little more sore, but say like your thrust, those kind of things, your reverse hypers, I can do those more frequently. So you want to make sure you're evening out so you can do a good amount. I do, I train three days a week, lower body. And as long as I'm making sure that I'm spacing those out correctly and hitting all of those movements, there's no way I could do step up or um, like deadlifts and like squats three days a week. There's no way that yeah. would destroy me. So, it's too taxing so on the overall really, nervous system, right? And, yeah, and your metabolic sure. system. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So with that really methodically thinking of that, then you can really make sure you're utilizing that training and getting the most out of it. So so let's talk a little bit more about that. I, I want to dive back into the vertical. So you talk about the vertical. These are some of the stretch positions. So this is going to help mm -hmm. um, not just create some meat to the glute, but it's really about the lower part of the glute going into that glute yeah. hamstring tie-in area. So for a lot of people, this is really beneficial because uh, flexibility is not great for uh, several people. I mean, we're sitting at a desk where, uh, you know, so we tend to have some shortened hip flexors our hamstrings tend to feel really tight. Um, and so these vertical movements are not just great for building out this juicy peach, but it's a really about getting through that tie-in. Walk us through those, uh, the list of exercises again. And if these are the exercises that you're wanting people to do generally once a week, how would you recommend somebody start and prioritize? Yeah. So I would say, um, just making sure to start out that we're really just getting our form down these ones. Um, you definitely can injure yourself a lot more, um, easily doing these mm -hmm. movements, deadlifts, squats, um, you know, RDLs, those kind of things. We want to make sure we have that form down really great before we start really loading the movement. So making sure you have those down and then adding in the load and then you can start adding in them more frequently. So say Mondays you're doing deadlifts and you're doing Bulgarian split squats, making okay. sure you have that down really well. Then Wednesdays we can do some RDLs. We can do some good mornings. Um, and then usually on the third, I, I normally don't put in vertical movements just because by that time I'm taxed on those movements. But, and really listening to your body. If you do those on Monday and you are so sore and you're like, there's no way, then take it down to those horizontal and the lateral movements for the other two days. Like really make sure you're getting those movements down. Your body is getting comfortable with that. The muscles feel, feel good and you don't feel pain. It's okay to feel sore. I mean, we all, especially when we're new, we're going to feel sore. Yeah. But being able to know the difference between sore and pain, I think is a big, is a big thing. Awesome. And you've got a lot of great examples of these movements on your, uh, on your social media. Um, but it, one of the things I want to go back to what you said earlier is it's okay to start without loading the exercise. So doing squats, doing some deadlift type movements without loading weight or with loading very, very little bit of weight. Because the form is everything. If you put bad form in and then you start to load, now you're just throwing bad form after bad and it's just garbage in, garbage out. If you've got garbage form, you're going to get garbage results. So really focusing on getting the right form so that you're activating and filling those muscles the right way. And uh, it is going to not only prevent injury, but it's going to get you better results over time, right? For 
for sure. So vertical once, maybe twice a week, depending on how you're pulling, pulling those things together, horizontal and lateral, you're throwing in uh, a couple of other times a week. Walk us through again, some of the horizontal exercises. What, what are your recommendations there? Yeah. So my favorite horizontal movement, and this is what kind of, um, made me fall in love with lower body and glute training are hip thrusts. So I love hip thrusts. They're such a great movement. They're also going, I mean, you're going to feel your quads, you're going to feel your hamstrings, but they're really targeting um, those glute muscles. And once I started hip thrusting, I mean, I feel like that's where I really started seeing the growth and just getting so much stronger in other areas. Um, There's some really cool studies out there. Like there was one, it was a baseball team and half the team started um, hip thrusting three days a week. And the other half just continued with their normal. Mm. um, workouts and the ones, I think they did it for eight weeks and the guys that did the hip thrust, their squats went up 30%. So in weight, and so like, it's huge. And so hip thrusts, they really help all, all aspects. You'll see your deadlifts go up. You'll see your squats go up. It it's an amazing exercise and I just really love it. So, um, hip thrusts are a good, great one. Back extensions are a great one. The 45 reverse hypers. I love those ones. I'll throw a band on, I'll grab a dumbbell and really just, you'll feel those. You'll really feel those in your glutes. Those ones are great. Um, so I love those bridges on the ground. I love, um, glute bridges as well. You can load those up and they're a great exercise as well. Um, so those are some of, some of my favorite ones, but hip thrusts, they, they're at the top. So a couple of things I want to unpack here. The first one is when you taught me how to do the 45s. Um, so getting mm-hmm. on the 45 degree uh, low back extension, that was something that, um, you know, I've been doing that exercise before, but you, you taught me a, a technique with that to really help to activate my glutes. That was just phenomenal. So anybody that knows how to do a hip barbell, hip thrust, you want to think through that same thrusting motion. So you're really pushing your hips into the pad rather than raising your body up. Right. Isn't that how you taught me how to do it? Yeah. And a lot of people you'll notice they hyperextend. Yeah. A lot of people try to use it. Like they're really using their back. They'll say, Oh my gosh, I feel that in my back. And, um, we definitely, we don't want to be feeling that in our lower back or feeling pain back there. So really, um, tucking that chin, a slight round in the back. And then just like you're thrusting into that pad, you're really going to feel that straight in, in the glutes. So, yeah. And that's something I think you, you demonstrate pretty well on, uh, on your social media as well. Um, now we got to pause for just a second. Cause you talked about that. You, uh, really like the hip thrust movement. That was the thing that you started to notice the most, uh, results with. And so we're going to, we're going to blast, uh, some, misconceptions out there for just a second, because a lot of women, and I've seen this for over 20 plus years where women say, well, I don't want to lift heavy. I don't want to lift heavy. I just, you know, I don't want to be bulky. I don't want to look like a man. I don't, Oh, heavy weight. It's bad. Right. All of these things. (laughs) Um, but how much weight are you using when you hip thrust? Uh, Right now I'm at 485. My goal for January 1st was 500. I had a little bit of a setback, but I think Hopefully soon we'll get to 500. So that's 485 pounds. And your goal is what? 500. Well, my goal is six to 700 long. That's, that's down the road though. Right. Right. But short-term goal is 500. So I want for anybody listening to this exercise or to this uh, podcast, pull up Shelby's Instagram, take a look at Shelby and You'll notice that this is not some manly looking bodybuilder that's walking around that uh, has a beard and armpit hair and walks around where people are like, oh, my gosh, look at that lady dude. Right. (laughs) Nobody's ever said that to you before, have they? Nobody's ever said that yet. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. good, good. Um, And you're lifting 485 pounds on that hip thrust. Ladies, if you want to build the muscle, you've got to put the work in and you've got to progressively lift heavier and heavier weights. Recently, Shelby, you did a great post showing uh, your progress 
and not only how you're lifting more weights, but you've changed the way that you're eating. You've changed the amount of calories that you're taking in. Can you tell our, our uh, female listeners why that's so important? Yeah. And, and to go back a little, like that's a huge misconception that you're going to become bulky and you're going to look like female bodybuilders, which there's nothing wrong with that. That's an a incredible career that I personally could never, like there's so much dedication and right. so much hard work. Like you're dedicating every minute of the day to, to that. Totally. And that's incredible. Yep. And so it, it, there's nothing wrong with looking like that. It's, it's incredible what their bodies can do. But for the average woman who is afraid they're going to start getting bulky, those women, they train so hard. The, you know, most of them are not natural. Like they're, they're yep. su- like taking things and there's supplements there's that they're taking enhancing in that drugs. Medicine. Yep. Performance yep. enhancing drugs. Yes. That they are taking to get to that bulky level. Any average woman that that's not going to happen to you really the beautiful thing is that it's going to put these super feminine, gorgeous, sexy curves on you. Like, nice. yep. it's, it's amazing what, what muscle can do. And then once, you know, you have that muscle and you lose a little bit of body fat, like it's the curves are amazing. And that's what most women want is they want to be curvy and they want to have a butt and they want to have that hourglass figure. Yeah. And, and that's what lifting can do for you. So so yeah, so when I first started, I I didn't really know a whole lot. I was eating around, you know, thinking that the less I ate, you know, I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to get to where I want to be, but I was eating like around 1200 calories and I'm 5'8 and so for someone my height that just is not enough food. It was yeah. I even my workouts like I was doing a lot of cardio. My workouts were not great. Like I was so tired it was messing hormonally with me. Like there were just so many things that eating that small, I was, I just was not in a great place. And so, um, like in the, in the post, you'll see it's a, it's a picture of me from eating 1200 calories and I just wasn't getting the results that I wanted and I could not figure out why. And then to the picture, the other picture that was just taken last week. And, um, I'm sitting at around 2200 at maintenance, 2200 calories. And I love, um, body recomping is great. I love, I don't love the whole, um, cycle of cutting maintenance, bulking, cutting maintenance, bulking. I feel like if you get to a weight that you like and Mm -hmm. you, um, can body recomp, I think that's a great place to be just sit at maintenance and your body will naturally Um, like I've done a post in the past where I was the same weight and, um, in the two pictures, but I was in one picture, I was a size eight, 10, which is beautiful. Nothing's wrong with that. But then in the other picture, same way I was down to a size two. So it's just recomping the fat into muscle and, and you're just, you're going to see changes in that. And so, um, Yeah. As far as calories, I realized that eating more was really what helped me. And it not only helped my workouts, my workouts were, I was so much stronger and I didn't feel exhausted after the first lift. Um, it also, your body needs starting. I started to eat more protein and really your body needs that protein and carbs. I was afraid of carbs as a lot of women are once I embraced carbs and started really using them to fuel my workouts Um, after my workouts, I really started to see the changes and, you know, I could never go back to less calories than, you know, around what I was eating, cutting. That's a different story. You want to be smart about it and make sure even when you're in a cut, you're not doing too low of a cut. You want to make sure you're still, you know, hormone, hormonally balanced and all of that. But, um, maintenance is such a fun place to be. (laughs) It really is. And when you, when you're at that maintenance calories, this is something I think is really important. You should live the majority of the time in your maintenance. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to lose a little bit of body fat here or there, you can do that over short periods of time. But, uh, really, if you just, for most people, my, my philosophy has always been, if you can just train better, you can train harder, you can train more intensely, and you can maintain the calories that you're currently at, you will start to build muscle. As you build muscle and you're training harder, you're burning 
calories, you're burning body fat. And so this is where this whole body recomposition concept comes in. Now, some people when you're, you know, let's say you've been overeating for a really long time, and you got 50 pounds to lose. Yeah, you're probably going to need to go on some sort of a cut uh, to get some of that weight off. But for most people that are in a relatively healthy range that want to grow and develop their glutes and they want to feel better, you don't have to change a significant amount of your calories, but you do probably want to play a bit with your macronutrients. And as you mentioned, you might want to get some more protein in. You might want to uh, make sure that you're being fueled appropriately for your body. You might want to be fueled with a little bit more carbohydrates so that you can go train heavy and uh, intensely in the uh, in the gym. Uh, but it really just comes down to what's working, right? So um, I think that's an important piece. When you were talking about building out this perfect peach uh, idea, that people need to make sure that it's not just the right training, but that you're thinking through the nutrition and all the other yes. aspects that play into it. Well, Shelby, great tips for our listeners uh, in the Building the Peach portion of our three-part series that we're doing here. Um, Hey, listeners, if you have questions for us, if you have things that you want to uh, get answered, I would encourage you to jump on and check out our master class on glutes. This is something that uh, we have collaborated with Shelby on, and she's done a phenomenal job of educating you on all of the details of how to exercise the right way. Uh, If you're not following Shelby as the queen of glutes on uh, social media, please make sure that you go follow her as well. And we're going to see you in the next episode of our three-part series on developing your glutes. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Evolve Podcast. Follow us on your favorite podcast app. And if you haven't done so, please give us a rating. As an independent podcast, it really helps us get more reach. This podcast is part of our mission to help millions of people evolve into the best versions of themselves. Please check out our coaching services at evolve-cast.com or pick up some of our Evolve merch. Until next time, keep evolving.